So we're in this series on gratitude. The, the pastoral staff and I met a few weeks ago and, and, and planned out sermon series. And we thought, you know, leading up to Thanksgiving, it'd be really, really good for us to focus on the subject of gratitude. It's needed. And we know it's the season of Thanksgiving because every store that I'm in is playing Christmas music. You know, and so that's the, that's the surefire tip off, right? Uh, Rudyard Kipling wrote books like Captain Courageous and The Jungle Book, and he made a lot of money writing books. A reporter came up to him one day and said, it's been estimated that you have made $100 for every word you've written. And so the reporter pulled out a $100 bill and said, give me one of your $100 bill, uh, words. And so Kipling grabbed the $100 bill, shoved it in his pocket and said, thanks. So if thanks is a $100 word, gratitude is a million dollar word. Cicero said this, gratitude is not only the greatest of all virtues, but the parent of all virtues. That's a fascinating thought. I think he might be onto something. In other words, all virtues flow from a heart of gratitude. Hmm. So this morning, I, I just kind of want to do a primer on the subject of gratitude. Last week, Bill took us into uh, Luke chapter 7, I believe it was, the story of, of Jesus having supper with Simon the Pharisee and the sinful woman coming and anointed his feet with oil and, and, and man, or washing his feet rather. Um, and he talked about the importance of self-awareness and being aware of our need and how, how that's connected to gratitude. Next week, Pastor Jay is going to talk about contentment and, and how that's linked to gratitude and kind of in between, in, in, I'm in the middle of this sandwich. I just want to talk a little bit about gratitude, why it's important, and uh, a little bit of, of, of what it really is. So let, let's start with um, two reasons gratitude is so important. So I just want to sell you on the idea if you're thinking, oh, gratitude, yeah, gratitude, schmatitude. Okay, if you, you know, get on with it. Okay, this is enormously important. Here's the first reason. The first reason is it pleases God. Here's what Hebrews 12, 28 says in the Living Bible. Since we have a kingdom nothing can destroy, let us please God by serving him with what? Thankful hearts. Okay? It doesn't say serving God with a grouchy attitude pleases him. Okay? Serving God with Thankful hearts, thankful hearts, please God. So as I was working on this message, I thought of a, of a blast from my past many, many, many years ago, probably 31, 32 years ago. My son Mark, who is 36 now, he learned to ride bicycle on his brother's hand-me-down bike. And so for Christmas one year, Dawn and I bought him a brand spanking new bicycle for Christmas and that's hard to wrap, uh, uh, you know, and put under a tree. And so I did something I thought was a good idea. In retrospect, it was a little bit mean, maybe. But we just, I took off the pedals and we wrapped them up in a box and put them under the tree. And so Mark opened his present and found bike pedals. And at first his face kind of dropped. And, but he was a great sport about it. And... Um, he looked up at us and said, thank you, Mommy and Daddy. I could really use some new pedals for my bike. And I said, well, let's, let's go down, you know, let's go down to the storage shed where the bikes are and let's put them on. And so he went down and I pulled out that brand spanking new bike and this was the look on his face. His little toothless smile. Um, that kid's like 6'4", 240 now, by the way. Um, and, and he, you know, okay, so we're 30 plus years later and that scene still makes me smile. Um, and and it, the gratitude, gratitude pleased me. Not only pleased me, it made me want to do more for him. And every single parent here knows exactly what I'm talking about. It also pleases our Heavenly Father when we're grateful for his goodness to us. Uh, Isaac Walton once said this, God has two dwellings, heaven and a humble, thankful heart. So gratitude pleases him is one reason. 
Second reason is that, that gratitude is a key to personal happiness. And, and I'm, probably, I'm, I'm probably stealing a little bit of your sermon because uh, you're going to talk about contentment in that link. And, of course, contentment and happiness are connected. Uh, we get that. Uh, okay, so, so you're saying, okay, how is gratitude connected to happiness? Well, I think it's pretty obvious, but let me use this illustration. So, so if, if, if you're not feeling very happy today, I could make you extremely happy within 24 hours simply by doing this, if I could. I mean, I, I can't do this, obviously, but play this out with me. Imagine that I had the power to call an IRS representative and have him call you and say, you're being audited and we've seized all your assets. And then you'd get another phone call from a doctor saying, you know what, we overlooked some stuff in your last visit and we think you have a terminal illness. And then you get a knock on the door and it's a policeman telling you that there'd been a terrible accident and somebody you love had died. What a horrible day. And then when, about the time that, that you think I can't take anymore, I show up at your door and I tell you, hey, none of it's true, okay? There's no IRS agent, you're not being audited, everybody's fine, you're fine. Wasn't that fun? And after you recovered from the shock and took a moment to punch my lights out, you would be exuberantly happy with exactly the same conditions that you'd had the day before, right? You'd have been so grateful for your health and so great, all of that, okay. So you get the idea. Your circumstances wouldn't be any different, but your attitude would have been transformed. And that's why we're calling this series Attitude of Gratitude. So we're gonna, we're gonna get into a scripture in Luke chapter 17. Um, fantastic passage of scripture. Let's just go through it and I'll give you a little background. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As you Have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests, and as they went, they were cleansed. So leprosy was an incurable disease that slowly eats away at your nerve endings. It, it, you, can't, you can't feel anything in your nerve endings. And, and so when something's wrong, you don't know it. You can't feel it. And so as a result, often lepers would lose their fingers and their toes and sometimes their ears and their noses and it was an awful disease and it was somewhat contagious and so in Bible times they had uh, well even more recently leper colonies and lepers had to stay by themselves and when anyone would get close to them this is the original form of social distancing by the way when anyone would get close to them they were required to cry out unclean unclean so instead of a mask, if you've tested positive for COVID, we just want you to shout that out, okay? <laughs> um, but they're required to say, unclean, unclean, and so people could stay away from them. So Jesus Christ represented their only hope, and they knew it. And so when Jesus approached, instead of shouting unclean, they shouted, have pity on us. And he did. He told them, Go show yourselves to the priests. And then here's what happened. Well, and as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw his healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. Take note of this. He was a what? Samaritan. Okay, we talked about Samaritans a few weeks ago, didn't we? He was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. 
Would it help if I used another mic? Is it a mic problem? Is it bigger? They're busy trying to fix it. Didn't hear me. Okay. So, so, so Luke takes pain, pains to point out that the one thankful person was a what? Samaritan. You think it's just my yep. mic? Oh. How about that? The light went out. So did we miss all of that for online? Probably. Do I need to back up? Except then we got that. Okay, so Luke takes pain to point out that the one thankful guy was a what? Okay. So this is fascinating to me. The Samaritans, as we talked about a few weeks ago, were a despised people group. Okay? And, and, and this man undoubtedly had experienced all-out religious and, 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 and social racism. From, um, from his kissing cousins, the Jews. And what's fascinating to me, it wasn't the guys with the good religious upbringing who came back and said thank you. It was the guy who really, really realized what a gift he'd been given. Kind of ties in with Bill's message last week, quite frankly, on self-awareness, right? So Jesus asked, where are the other nine? Okay. Didn't I heal 10 of you guys? Only one of you came back? Well, it's a fair question. And, uh, but it's pretty typical. It's pretty typical. Ask teachers how many students ever come back and say thank you. Um, those who serve in public office, how many people say thank you for the work you do? Trust me. People in positions of authority making some of these decrees about COVID, they're not getting thank you notes. Ask mothers, how many kids come up to you? How many kids, how many of your kids came up to you this week and said, mom, it's amazing. My drawers and closets were filled with clean clothes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, right. And by the way, Young people, if you do that today, it's going to come across as disingenuous. So say so. Let, give it, just give it a couple of days. All right. All right. So let's talk about why it's hard to be grateful. Ready? Here's the first one: unrealistic expectations. There's something about our day and age that conditions us to think that life is supposed to be free of pain and disappointment. There's something about our day and age that conditions us to think that science and money can fix everything. Which is why, again, I, I hate to beat the COVID thing to death, but it's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. We just think, man, we, we should be able to solve any problem. And we're, we're like eight months into this deal and it's worse than ever. And it's, you know, unrealistic expectations. No, we are not God. We cannot solve every problem. So anyway, because of all the conveniences, just, uh, we just have life so good, our expectations are so high. So anytime life is less than perfect, you think you've been ripped off. But Jesus said, in this world you will have, can anybody fill in the blank? Trouble. Jesus said, in this world you'll have trouble. And we Christians need to understand that we were not made for this world anyway. So of course we're gonna have trouble. One of the best phrases I've ever come across is this simple phrase. Give life permission to be. To be what? Well, just to be life. To be less than perfect. To roll with the punches. So unrealistic expectations. Another one is our affluence. Now, no, no, nobody here thinks they're affluent. I get that. You know? I preached a sermon once in the, in the church I used to pastor and I, I, I began by asking, how many of you are rich? Of course, nobody raised their hand. And I raised my hand and said, I am. 
you know. According to recent statistics, most of us here in this room are in the top 95% of the world's population for wealth. And we're, we're okay? So, so even if you struggle financially, just think of, just think of all that you have available to you that wasn't even possible 100 years ago. Indoor heating and air conditioning, television, cell phones, indoor electricity, indoor plumbing, did somebody say? Yeah, you're rich. Our affluence. I've heard it said that our culture suffers from affluenza, not influenza, affluenza. Now here's the problem, and this is human nature. It shouldn't be this way, but it is. Generally speaking, the more we have, the less grateful we are. The more we have, the harder we are to please. I mean, I get that. Um, any Chevy truck people here? Yeah, see? If you ever drove my Ford F-150, you wouldn't want to go back to your Chevy. You wouldn't be satisfied. If you've, if you've been on a beach in Hawaii, it's hard to get excited about visiting a state park in Iowa, probably, right? I mean, you know, um, if you've driven a Mercedes, you're not getting excited about a Ford Escort. So affluence conditions us to expect more and more and more. So that, that's just part of the world we live in, okay? Um, negative companions, this is a big one. The Apostle Paul wrote this, do not be misled, bad company corrupts good character. So here's the deal. <laughs> if your closest friends and the people you spend time with are grateful people, are grateful, gracious people, you probably will lean toward becoming more grateful, more gracious. If the people you hang around with are complainers and nothing's ever good enough, that's gonna soak in to you. So companions, and, and, and I, you know, I, I need to be careful how I say this, but in my life at least, I have to be careful that I schedule time in with energy givers, okay? Because there, there's no shortage of energy drainers around, energy givers, so, so companionship. And then, and then one more frequent comparisons. Man, we're good at come. Have you ever noticed when we compare, we never compare down and say, thank you, God, I've got it so good. It's kind of like we compare up, you know? Um, not always, but you know? No, so here's the deal, no matter how good you have it, there's always somebody that appears, I'm gonna say appears, to have it better. You know, one of the things that kills us with a comparison thing and I'm not, I'm not talking about stuff, but I'm talking about relationships and the whole deal. One of the things that just kills us is social media, you know, and Facebook, you know? Because people just put their best stuff on social media, you know? They don't put their bad days on, so, well, some people do. But, you know, you look at that and you just think, oh man, they just got it so good. And they're, their kids are so awesome, you know? Yeah, you're looking at each other saying, yeah, I've been there, done that, right? So the comparison thing. Okay, so those, those are some, some, some really reasons that we battle every day. And if, if you just kind of make yourself aware of those and you find yourself doing that, you can catch yourself and say, okay, Lord, help me with that. Okay, I'm doing it. All right, so on with our primer on gratitude. Let's talk about what it isn't. Sometimes to understand what something is, is helpful to rule out what it isn't. Let's look, let's look at verses 12 through 14 again. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. So there are just a few things here that gratitude isn't. Okay, first of all, gratitude isn't recognizing God for who he is. All right? 
As Jesus approached, they shouted, Jesus, master, the word master is reserved for somebody in authority. They knew that Jesus was somebody special, powerful. Maybe they weren't in touch yet with the fact that he was in the Messiah, but, the Messiah, but uh, you know, they were aware of who he was. Now, here's the point I want to make. Mm. Some of the most ungrateful people I've known in my life had perfect theology. Ooh, you okay? Hang on, I'll get to something you like here pretty soon. The fact of the matter is, you can have your theology down pat. You can believe the right stuff and still be consumed by ingratitude. Okay? Secondly, it isn't even recognizing our need of him. You know, they have pity on us, they said. Our only hope... Jesus, as if you have pity on us. They didn't have a who needs God attitude, uh, but they weren't grateful. And then one more, and it isn't even in responding in obedience to him. Um, I'm impressed by the obedience of all 10, right? No one questioned Christ. And now it's interesting. Did you notice this? He didn't heal them on the spot. He didn't heal them. Bam! Now go show yourself to the priest. He commanded them to go show themselves to the priest. And what does it say? As what? As they went. As they obeyed. They were healed, right? Okay. You know, so the point I'm trying to make is these guys did a lot of things right. They realized who Christ was. They realized their need of him. They even responded in obedience. But only one was grateful. All right. Let's talk about some key ingredients. Gratitude's hard to define, kind of like love. How do you define love with a short, simple definition? You can't. I love my wife and I love pizza. I hope those don't mean the same thing. Gratitude. It's kind of like one of those words. How do you, how do you get a handle on it? Um, can't define it simply or easily, but I see some key ingredients in these verses that'll help us get a handle on it. Let's go to verses 15 and 16 again. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. First of all, I think genuine gratitude includes recognition of both the gift and the giver. If you treat God like a vending machine, that's not gratitude. There's got to be a relationship with the giver. This grateful Samaritan not only recognized he'd been healed, he recognized the source of the healing and he came back and he threw himself at Jesus' feet. True gratitude isn't limited to being thankful for the blessing. So imagine 30, 31 years ago, when Dawn and I gave Mark the bike and he wanted to take off on his first ride, and I said, hey, let me grab my bike, we'll go together. He turned around and said, no, Dad, I don't want you around. Ouch. You mean all I'm good for is to give you stuff? Hmm tracking with me, right? True gratitude isn't limited to being thankful for the blessing. Grateful people throw themselves at the feet of the giver of the blessings. Grateful people worship. Grateful people say, I don't want to treat you as a vending machine, Jesus, just to get stuff I need and want. I want a relationship with you. Here's the second thing. Communication is a sign of gratitude. Gratitude finds a way to express itself. He not only came back and praised, he did it in a loud voice. Did you notice that? Um, gratitude doesn't worry about looking silly. Gratitude doesn't worry about being embarrassed. One of the characteristics of real gratitude is that it refuses to be silent. Refuses to be silent. 
When you're really grateful, you have to find some way to express it. By the way, it's the reason we call the holiday Thanksgiving Day. We don't call it Thankfulness Day. We give thanks. One more. I think humility is a sign of gratitude. You can't be grateful and proud at the same time. Because, well, you can't be. Because gratitude is simply admitting, I have something I don't deserve. If I deserved it, you know, okay, so, so, I don't know, let's use this illustration. You have a job and you get your paycheck, you know you did a good job, you know you deserve that paycheck. You don't fall at your employer's feet and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. No, you earned that, right? I mean, but let's say you got a great big old Christmas bonus. There's a difference. Gratitude, gratitude is understanding that, that I've been given this, so I can't be proud about that. I, I think it's notable that the leper threw himself at Jesus' feet, posture of humility because he was struck by the realization that he had received a gift from God that he didn't deserve, a gift that he couldn't earn, a gift he could never repay. And the logical consequence was humility. Again, this ties in with Bill's sermon last week. When we realize all that God has done for us, and I'm not just talking about material stuff and physical blessings. Those are all temporary. I'm grateful for them, but those are all temporary. I'm talking about forgiveness and acceptance and purpose and relationship and salvation. When we realize that he freely has given us what we don't deserve, there is no room for pride in that. None. None. In fact, I think a good rule of thumb is at the point I start to feel prideful is the point that I cease to be grateful. So what's gratitude? Okay, here's my clumsy approach at it. It's humbly recognizing that I've received blessings I don't deserve, can't earn, and could never repay, and then communicating thanks. Let's wind it down. Let me give you some concluding observations. Looks like we froze. It's just been that kind of morning, hasn't it? Just fantastic. There we go. Here's the first one. Jesus is approachable no matter the circumstances. Besides the fact that he had an incurable illness um, that required that he say, unclean, stay away. Remember, he was a Samaritan. Jews looked down on Samaritans. And there would have been those who have looked at him as he approached Jesus, and they would have scolded him and say, dude, Jesus doesn't have time for you. Not only, not only are you a leper, for goodness sakes, you're a Samaritan. You have no right to approach him. And there would have been people who would have said that, and those people would have been wrong. This story tells me Jesus is passionately interested in every one of us. And that no matter my baggage, no matter my problems, no matter my circumstances, no matter my sins, no matter my background, he is approachable Jesus master have mercy on me mm. uh, this story also tells me that faith and gratitude are inseparably connected Jesus says something fascinating in verse 19 rise and go your faith has made you well he didn't tell him that his gratitude had made him well your faith has made you well but faith later was expressed through gratitude. 
Now listen, listen. If you're a person of genuine faith, you will also be a person of gratitude. You cannot separate them. And then one more. Faith results in wholeness. King James Version translates verse 19 like this. Thy faith hath made thee whole. I like that translation better. The, the Greek word can be translated either whole or well, but, but, but whole, man, that, that has a bigger meaning, doesn't it? You know, when we, when we think well, we just think in terms of a physical healing. But the fact of the matter is the Greek word also can mean saved. Your faith has saved you. While it's fantastic to experience the miracle of physical healing, let's be honest, any physical healing in this life is temporary. I'm grateful. It's temporary. How much more wonderful and how much more important to experience the miracle of spiritual healing, of being made right with God. Mm. And that's the gift that Jesus offered leper number 10 that day. The gift that the other nine could have had. Your faith has made you what? Whole. So here's the thing. If you've experienced wholeness in Christ by receiving him and trusting him for salvation, please, 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 don't ever lose sight of the fact that every day you are enjoying a gift that you can't earn, that you don't deserve, that you can never repay. And every day, allow that realization to make you throw yourself at his feet in gratitude. Now, secondly, if you haven't experienced wholeness, remember this. He's, he's approachable. He's approachable. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter the hurt you've been through. Doesn't matter the pain you've experienced. He's approachable. Again, I keep referencing Bill's sermon. Doesn't matter if you're in debt 50 denarii or 500 denarii. If you're broke and can't pay it, doesn't matter. Jesus did pay it. So no matter what you're struggling with, no matter your past, He wants to make you whole. I'd like to pray with you, please. Lord God, I just want to thank you for the privilege of worshiping today with the congregation at Hillside Wesleyan Church, on site and online. And we thank you for the technology that allows us to connect during a time like this. Lord God, there's just, um, there's just so much in this life that can make us crabby and complaining. There's so much in this life that can just suck the gratitude from our hearts. So Lord God, I pray that this very morning you would recalibrate our spirits, helping us to understand what you've done for us, that you've done something for us we could never do for ourselves and that that realization would make us eternally grateful. doesn't mean that life's going to be problem-free, but we're grateful for the fact that you walk with us through every situation. And, and now, Lord God, especially, I want to pray for anyone here on site or online who are thinking that they can't cry out to you. Help them to understand they can cry out to you you're intensely interested in their life, that you care, and that faith can make them whole as well. Thank you again, Father. We love you. We long to glorify you 
in everything we say, everything we do, and everything we think. It's in Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen.